Today I am with my dear friend and neighbor, textile artist Hazel Butterfield Tate, and she is going to make tea and scones for us and tell us about growing up in the 50s and 60s in post-war London and the lovely garden, food garden, her mother kept. She certainly did. And hello everybody, and it's lovely to be here and looking forward to sharing stories with you. Great. Let's see. <laughs> Hi pretty girl. Hi pretty girl. How do you feel with all those fur gone? So for the main event. Scone making. Hazel is going to make scones, or as she likes to call them, scones. <laughs> So tell us your recipe. It's very simple. Three cups of flour tipped into the bowl. That was it. This is one and a half cups, so two of those. And uh, nothing precious about this recipe. It's a sort of a, a fail-proof recipe. So I've made scones many times before, and uh, the recipe is very simple. We're going to share it with you today. And if there's one secret that I will divulge, be generous with the butter. Do not hold back. Well, I can lift so my how hands fine on. do you go, Hazel, before it's gotta, you... It's got to be really fine. You've got to rub it all in. And some of my butter was a little hard. Usually I let it sit out, but the, some of the butter was a little hard, so it'll take a little while to soften it in. And so how much butter did you actually put in there? I put in a whole slab. <laughs> uh, three can cups. you be more specific? <laughs> well, okay, what do we got here? A what whole we slab. Got? It's half a cup, cup. yeah. yeah. So and actually a little tiny bit more. But don't tell Kay. <laughs> we'll have more on the inside too. Yeah, we'll have more. It's it's all about the butter. It's okay, all about looks, the butter. That looks good to me. Oh, now there, what do you there's, do? There's still there's still, still chunks in go? there because oh. um, some of it was a little harder. You got to let the air in. The whole idea is to lift it and let the air in. That makes your scone light. She uses aluminum-free baking powder, so it's great to find one that. Yeah, doesn't have be, any aluminum in it. And you used, fi you said five small teaspoons, five small but teaspoons. you actually used <laughs> five teaspoons. Um, I can show you what I used. Well, you it, like. Did you use less than a teaspoon? Yes, I did. Okay. Because, well, that's a big teaspoon. So I used about that much. Okay. And now you can use any fruit that you like. If I have blueberries, I put blueberries and raisins. My grandchildren love the blueberries in there. So if you've got um, blueberries, they're wonderful. Um, raspberries. I mean, there are many, many ways to make scones. People can make savory scones with cheese. I put a lot of fruit in. Well, then a plain scone is all about the cream and the, and the strawberry jam. To me, a scone is about the fruit that's in it. So yeah, I really pepper the scone mix with a lot of fruit. So we beat up one egg, like that. Try not to get shell in it. I don't think I actually put egg in my scones. Okay, well this is what I do and um, people seem to yum them up so I keep well, making I them. Well I think it's great because egg always adds, adds yeah. something, you know. Yeah, and then I'm going to get some milk too and I put in half a cup of milk. Yeah, I use almond milk, no, unsweetened. I don't sweeten my scones um, because we have a little bit of jam maybe on them and the fruit makes them sweet enough. You don't actually need. You just make a well, pour it all in like that and then literally we just try and mix it in as quickly as possible because you don't want to let the air out that you've created um, the lightness by all that um, sifting that I did, all that rubbing of the mm -hmm. of the fat into the. Um, You're just kind of lifting it over. I'm folding just it li over. lifting it and yeah, folding it in. Well, I can't <clears throat> wait to see how you're going to shape them. Oh, that's another whole step. I'm just rolling the dough slightly in the the mixture, slightly in the bowl to gather up the the last of the fruit. Just getting it together. Always trying to keep a lightish touch if possible. You don't want to make your dough heavy. <clears throat> was your mother a good cook? She made great pastry. She was a great pastry cook. So I'm just going to roll the, pin, the rolling pin <clears throat> slightly in the flour just to so it doesn't stick to the dough. We're almost there. See, very little touching and handling and 
binding together. It doesn't matter if it's slightly rough and the, the, the fruit is out on top of it. There we go. So we're there. If I want to feed lots of people, I use this size. If it's just for the family coming round, I'll get about eight scones out of that mix with the big cutter. Which one do you want to go with, Kay? We need to go with the big one. Let's go with the big size, okay. So we start, and we just push down like that, and lift, and then I've just prepared a, um, a tray with parchment. So we'll put that over here, and that will go into the oven. And I just push down again and just take off any loose, loose pieces and scoop bits into it and just, you know, waste not, want not, don't waste it. So here we go, press down, twist slightly. I mean, I've used a, I've used a glass, you know, if um, you don't have a cutter. Don't worry that they're slightly oh, yeah. falling apart. They'll all cook together. Something tells me you're going to brush these with something. So I you am. Have a brush. I'm going to brush them with some, just some egg over here, which will, uh -huh, yes. will whip up. You can use milk or egg. I use that. egg. It just gives a nice um, sort of glossy finish to the scone. Mm -hmm. They don't usually come apart like that. Must have put a lot of fruit. But there. that's good. There, raisins I, actually have a lot of nutrients, don't ah. they? Don't they? I think I, they do. I'm sure they do. Okay, nearly there. Yeah, usually they're a little more sort of doughy. These ones are very fruity, which is good. Put that one on. All right, so what did we count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It's wonderful. So we've got 11 out of them, and then we're just going to uh, mix up the egg and brush it on. One free range egg. Mm -hmm. Organic free range egg, actually. And give them a good brushing, and it doesn't matter if it spills over. Well, you were saying earlier that, you know, with all of your textiles and your grandmother and all of the things that you do managing the household, you don't have a lot of time for to actually grow a garden. I wish I did, but yeah, you're right. All right. You can also do that just with the egg white, can't you? You can, or just milk. So now we're going to put these in the oven for about um, 18 minutes at about 375. Ooh, is this PJ Tips or whatever? That is, um, it's either an Australian, uh, English, black tea or English, yeah. Because we bought some. Australian. I love your new picture. I know. This is, is this dinosaur? That's from Dinosaur in Sydney, from my wow. beautiful friend of mine, Victoria. Mm. Oh, that hits the spot. Is it? Yeah. Is that, is that hitting the spot? Mm -hmm. Wait, let me stick it. Mm. It's hot. <laughs> oh, hot, yeah. Oh, my. How much of this furniture did you actually... Oh, well, you made all the curtains, obviously. Oh, yeah, made the curtains. Make all, made all the... We did all the art. This is with my granddaughter. Look at that little chair. So cute. I remember when growing up in London, and um, we would play outside in the garden until it was dusk. And I remember my first pair of roller skates that were the strap-on roller skates. And we would um, skate up and down our little street called Ildersley Grove. And we would laugh and play with other kids in the street. It was beautiful, it was lovely. I mean, kids do it 
no, I just remember. I mean, it's not my first memory. I think my first memory is when I was about two and we were staying in a little cottage on the Isle of Wight, which is in the south, southernmost part of England. We used to go to the Isle of Wight every year. And I remember standing in my crib and standing up and holding on and watching this, these hundreds of caterpillars going on the outside of the window. There was a plague of caterpillars that year. That must have been about 1955, because I was born in 53. Wow. And I was only two, and I can remember that so clearly. When and even the net curtain in front of all of these caterpillars, but I just watched them climbing across the window. Hmm. Isn't that funny? Yeah. You remember that when you were two? Two. <laughs> yeah. Caterpillars. Yeah. Because I've traced that <laughs> Your back. Your first memory is I caterpillar. Know. Caterpillars, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is funny, isn't it? Yeah. Garden and ca caterpillars. Yeah. In a beautiful part of England. Yeah. yeah. It must have been summertime. Mm. How did you get interested in textiles, working with textiles? Hmm. Yes. My Aunt Lena, <laughs> my Aunt Lena, who was a great inspiration to me, she had been with the British Council serving in. I think um, Brazil and uh, with her husband. Anyway, she took a great interest in antique textiles and especially beautiful early lace and handmade lace and things like that. She went to Oxford. She was a very um, educated woman. Uh, she took a great interest in antique lace and she, it spilled out on uh, uh, to me. I was living in London and she came up from the country but she would come up and sell her wares. I think she went to auctions in the country and things like that mm -hmm. and bought beautiful lace and I just loved it. It just opened a sort of a whole new door to me and I started to collect. I remember buying my first piece of lace from an antique shop on uh, Kensington Church Street which I'm sure I paid over the top for. Um, I've since gone into far better places for searching, for finding, for bargains and what have you around the world in my travels since then. But my first piece came from an antique shop that I was working in as a sort of an extra Saturday job. I was, while well, I was now living in London, working in Regent Street as a personal assistant uh, in a company called uh, Delarue. They made playing cards. On Saturdays, I would love to go and do, I worked in the antique shop and then I started collecting. and. And then I think I met my husband, who just sort of like really encouraged me to create, to make. Um, I was working for a, the boss of this company in um, Regent Street, and he said, Hazel, always go to the top. So I started making little bags. I was making shirts out of silk, um, and he introduced me to the White House on Bond Street. I don't know what happened, because I don't think I ever got into the White House on Bond Street. But he said, go to the top. Always take your pieces to the top, because he was at the top. I mean, you know, private aeroplanes and six cars and everything hand chauffeur, uh, washed by the chauffeur and private um, accounts at Hamley's in Regent Street for the kids' toy shopping and what have you. Um, but I did take that piece of advice from him and um, sort of tried to start at the top. So I went to this very beautiful shop on Bond Street and showed them my pieces. And um, How many I, did you have at that time? Oh, not that many. I mean, maybe a dozen. But actually it was my husband, Nick, Nick Tate, the actor, and who was working in London, and Aussie, but working in London, who introduced me to Trisha Guild, Designers Guild. I worked for them for years, making and creating for them, and. Um, and that was a lot of fun and very well paid. I mean, now I've got boxes and boxes and boxes of things, and I don't know that I'll ever get through them all. But um, I obviously had a small amount and a sewing machine, always a sewing machine and somewhere to cut. Doesn't have to be a large area. I've worked outdoors. I've made areas when we had a house with no spare room for a craft room I I made a sort of a, a plastic sheeted or Nick helped me make a plastic sheeted area that was on Bienvenida in Los Angeles and I worked out there in the rain or whatever because I had these plastic drop sheets that came <laughs> down or put them up when it was warm and I would cut and paint and sew and 
repurpose. Mm -hmm. So really for about 40 years, repurposing, which was an art that I very much picked up from my family growing up in London. It was all about recycling, reusing, totally out of necessity. We composted, every scrap would go into the composting heap and that went on the garden and that every inch of our garden was edible. But out of necessity, yeah, every, because there were three of us and, you know, economy wasn't fabulous and so you saved your money and my father made rucksacks out of old army um, canvas blankets and then he would use those and go shopping with those to the Brixton market for the things that we couldn't grow, I don't know, onions or whatever it was that he went and bought. And yeah, my mother would, we had peach trees and loganberry bushes and blackberry bushes and crabapple trees and Victoria plum and uh, Cox's orange pippin. So the most wonderful thing was coming back from our holidays. We had our annual two-week holiday in August um, and we would catch the trains from Waterloo train down to the Isle of Wight and take the ferry over to the Isle of Wight. Always our holidays were either on Dartmoor or on the Isle of Wight. In Dartmoor we stayed in an old army hut it, was, it wasn't luxurious, you know, it was, but we would go picking blackberries and make blackberry and apple crumbles and my mother and I would go picking mushrooms and lots of mushroom omelettes. We, we, we uh, what's, foraged. Yeah. Foraging. Yeah. And wild strawberries, you know, hedgerows full of beautiful, these tiny, sweet, wild strawberries, which are beautiful. I expect you can grow them in... Portland and places like that. I don't think they grow them here so much. Maybe you know about that, I don't know. But wild strawberries in English lanes were delicious. Have you been back to the Isle of Wight? Do they still have wild areas you can forage? Yes, yes, I have been back to the Isle of Wight because funnily enough, my husband Nick's family live just a stone's throw almost from where I spent all those uh, summer holidays and so we're, we're 11 years apart and so he was probably jogging along the beach saying who's that brat you know because I was 11 years and he was 21 and, and his family lived in Freshwater Bay and we would um, he would swim at uh, Compton Bay which is where we stayed in a little thatched cottage in Compton Bay and we would go and help milk the cows and then I would pretend I was milking the cows when I wasn't milking the cows and and um, Loved the farming life, really should have grown up on a farm, but grew up in London and then Sydney and then Los Angeles and maybe there's a farm in there. I love visiting my friends who have farms. Do you miss having a garden? I'm not the brilliant farmer because I'm a stitcher. I'm a sewer, I'm a painter in textiles of uh, painting and sewing. And, and I, the time I have between grandkids and all the rest of the busy life that we, lives that we lead, is spent stitching. Hand stitching is absolutely bliss for me. It's peaceful and it's like a meditation. And uh, I love to hand sew. And yeah. When did you come up with the wristbands? The, the cuffs were, because I never waste a scrap. So I was like, what can I make with these? These beautiful, tiny, tiny scraps. And so I went, you know what? I'm going to make a bracelet. And um, so I've made hundreds. Mm, all hand stitched and and sometimes you know it's a little tricky because they don't fit somebody but then I just say don't worry don't worry I'll make an eye extend it I put another scrap on the end you know it seems to me that you put your creativity in everything you do well I enjoy I enjoy um, being with people and eating with people friends love what loved ones family there's always I, a, something a little extra special even if I stop by for a cup of tea there's flowers or there's a candle lit or there's always a little bit of something extra special, and that's just that's just who you are, I think. You know, you're always wearing something creative, obviously, because you have so many things. Did you feel growing up that, that uh, most everybody was in the same boat that you were in, your neighbors and everybody? Everybody was trying to make ends meet? Uh, no, I didn't. I felt that, um, you know, we didn't have a car. Actually, we had the chance to have a car, but my father, who had been in the North Sea on minesweepers during the war, he rather lost his nerve. And when they came back from the, the war, he and his brother purchased a car together. 
but he never had the nerve to drive. And so, funnily enough, he rode a bicycle for his, the whole rest of his life, um, cycling from where we lived in London, which was in Dulwich, all the way up to uh, uh, Threadneedle Street, which is where the bank, opposite the Bank of England, which is where his office was. And he would cycle, it was about eight and a half miles. And he would leave his suit there and cycle up in trousers with bicycle clips around his, tri uh, around his um, trousers to stop them getting into the, the um, spokes and the chain. And um, he never drove. So we walked and caught buses everywhere. And I'm, I'm a walker now, I think, because it, plus those holidays, especially the ones on Dartmoor, were walking holidays and he would set the pace. And even as little kids, we were walking eight miles or, you know, up to 11 miles. And he, he trained us, really. It was quite vigorous. Some members of the family weren't too keen. I seemed to love it. And I loved being on Dartmoor and the rowan trees and the blackberries and the blueberries and picking those and, and jumping on rocks and rivers. And I loved all that. The garden was your mother's domain, right? The garden mostly was my mother's domain. My father helped with... Um, maybe the blackberries and things like that, but because we, we had big bushes of raspberries and blackberries and loganberries. We had a peach tree, which my mother would um, take a paintbrush and she would cross-pollinate to make sure that it produced fruit. And um, have you had to do that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did it with my apple tree. Yeah. And yeah, it worked. Wonderful. It worked. She yeah. used to grow, grow these beautiful peaches in London, can you imagine? But in a greenhouse, no? No. Wow. No greenhouse, no, nothing like that. Uh, none of, none of our, our fruits were um, in greenhouses, or in a greenhouse. Everything was out in the open, just trusting on the sun, that we would get enough sun, because it's always whether you're going to get enough sun in London. Yeah. You know, England. And what about, uh, it freezes there, doesn't it? Oh yeah, and the pipes freeze and it's icy and we had no central heating. I had ice on the window in my bedroom waking up and my mother would put a stone hot water bottle in my bed and um, the water beside my bed would get a little layer of ice on it. That's how cold it was. We used to just put a sweater over our heads and go underneath the sheets and blankets and and then she'd call us in the morning and we ran from our bedroom to the bathroom where there was a water heater and she'd have our school uniform on the water heater. But yeah, growing up without heating, I can remember standing, reading a book for probably hours on end in front of the hot water pipes um, <laughs> in the kitchen because we had the boiler there. They called it the boiler and that's where you put the coke all the smoke fuel, all terrible, that we can't burn anymore, wouldn't want to burn anymore, you know, the coal and the coke. And, and uh, yeah, I would stand, stand with my back on these pipes for hours reading my book because it was so cold. But we had an open fire in the front room and that was lovely when that was lit and then later on a gas fire and we would toast crumpets over the open fire, you know, on a pronged thing. For very, people who don't lovely. know what a crumpet is, what is a crumpet? What a crumpet? <laughs> what would you call it? They actually sell them in Trader Joe's. They're a, sort of a spongy, um, a spongy dough, round, like a tea cake size, with holes on the top. And um, I don't know, is there a name for them here? A crumpet. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever had one. A tea crumpet. Yeah, they're lovely. They're delicious. You toast them and then the butter melts and it drips through the holes and it's entirely messy. And then you put honey and then that drips through the holes and then that's entirely sticky and messy. And then the most delicious thing if it's snowing outside and you're sitting by a fire and it's cold. or You can now do them in a toaster. You don't have to have an open fire. But they are delicious, but they're a real, it's like eating a mango. You've got to watch it. You're not wearing your best suit or something. Mm. Mm. So I was telling you about how beautiful it was to come back from the summer vacation on the Isle of Wight or on, in Dartmoor and just see the robust growth on the, on the trees and the apple trees and the plum trees and the bloom, the bloom on the plums was something I love to look at. If you don't know what bloom is on a plum, it's like a perfect, fresh uh, coating 
of newness. Once you touch that plum, it's got fingerprints over it. And I think with most fruit that we get commercially, they polish them or something. And so there's no bloom. But when you pick a plum off a tree and it's never been touched, it's beautiful. And Victoria plum, I don't know whether they have them in America, was the most delicious plum. It's a purple outside skin and then a yellow flesh. And it's delicious when they're ripe. They are so sweet. And of course, we'd come home and there'd be 50 or 60 beautiful plums to pick. And my mother, my mother was a great preserver. So she would, we were allowed to have some of the fruit, but she would bottle, bottle fruit. And she, because of course we didn't have freezer, we didn't even have a refrigerator. We had a marble slab in a in a larder, and that's where she would keep the bottles. Wait, of milk. you didn't have a refrigerator? No refrigerator. No, no ice box. No, no ice box. Nothing. If we had dinner or lunch, and then we were going to have like a, a treat, which was ice cream, uh, which came in a block with three flavors, like chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, something like that. I think they called it Metropolitan. One of us would run round to the sweet shop, which was around the corner from Mrs. Phoebe, and buy the block of ice cream, which was wrapped in newspaper, and then bring that home, and then we'd have our dessert, because we had no ice chest. So other people did have ice chests, and my mother always referred to somebody being very well off if they had cream delivered on their front doorstep. That was her sign of very well off. Check out these wonderful, they're almost like denim, but what are they, Hazel? Indigo. Indigo. Everything is indigo here. Absolutely stunning. Are these all vintage fabrics? Yes. Or did you... Yes. Um, I'm fascinated by how people create using skin, animal skin, or whatever it is out of absolute what is around them, you know, bark of tree. And these are all indigo textiles from different parts of the world. So there's Hill Tribe in China, there's uh, African cloth. Uh, this one is from Africa, these pieces, and they're loomed in like five uh, inch strips and then hand stitched together and hand dyed and, and with indigo. I mean, it's just beautiful. I love them in collection. And, um, and the fact that different cultures use indigo in their own way. What, denim? You know, I mean, denim was here, what, from the 20s or the, the 1900s, created into clothing, and that's indigo. I it? bought indigo seeds when I was in Vancouver. There you go. And I've never planted them, because I don't think they would do well here. They probably need, what, more heat? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, because everywhere it grows is hot. Every place you've mentioned is yeah. hot. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Right. That's it. Uh, let's check on the scones. Okay, yeah. back to the scones. <laughs> This much butter is for me, right? Yeah, that's all it was. <laughs> If you enjoyed this video, please watch these. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And I'll see you in the next video.